Most presidents come into office full of hubris, thinking, intoxicated by victory, thinking they're the smartest person in the room. Most of them get over it. Donald Trump has not. Today on Between You and Me, I sit down with Chris Whipple, author of The Gatekeepers, how White House Chiefs of Staff come to define every presidency. George Washington didn't have a chief of staff. Lincoln didn't have a chief of staff. Um, who was the first chief of staff? Most historians would say that Sherman Adams was the first under Dwight Eisenhower. As a matter of fact, my work here, as I understand, will be not only to um, be act as liaison between the president's office and the department to a very considerable extent, also the coordination of the activities within the White House uh, I shall be uh, pretty close to the boss, and that's uh, a great thing for me, I assure you. He was a rough, gruff character. He was called the abominable no man because he, he told Eisenhower what he didn't want to hear when necessary, which, of course, is the most important thing a chief of staff can do. I began in the book with H.R. Haldeman under Richard Nixon because Haldeman really wrote the template for the modern, empowered White House Chief of Staff. He was called the Lord High Executioner by Nixon and also his pluperfect son of a bitch. Um, and so the irony, of course, is that Haldeman was the poster boy for Watergate, the biggest scandal in American history. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. And yet, every Chief of Staff since Haldeman would tell you that he wrote the template for the modern position. What made Haldeman somebody that was able to kind of write this rule book essentially for future chiefs of staff? It's really because Richard Nixon empowered him in a way that no president had ever empowered his lieutenant. Nixon had learned by example. He'd, of course, been vice president under Eisenhower. But Nixon and Haldeman were obsessed with this position. Haldeman was convinced that they could make the White House run more effectively than any previous White House. And so Haldeman became not only famously the gatekeeper, uh, who is really in charge of not only access to the Oval Office, but giving the president time and space to think. He was the honest broker of information, making sure that only the toughest decisions got into the Oval Office. He was, at the end of the day, in Haldeman's case, the person who executed the president's agenda, and of course, it all worked well until it came apart during Watergate, which resulted in Haldeman going to prison and Nixon resigning in disgrace. Much has been made of obviously how quickly President Trump seems to go through people, whether it's his chiefs of staff position or just people around the cabinet and his administration. Um, what do you make of former Chief of Staff John Kelly's admission to the LA Times that he should be judged in the annals of history not for what Trump did, but for what Trump didn't do. Something is clearly wrong when the Chief of Staff tells you that he was the thin line between the President and disaster for us all. Um, you know, it's, it's become sort of a cliche to say that the White House Chief is the grown up in the room. That seems to be what Kelly would have us believe. Should that be the measure of a chief of staff? What they allowed the president not to do as opposed to what they helped him achieve? No, it's not nearly enough to pre prevent the president from doing bad things. So in, in that sense then, you don't buy John Kelly's, I guess, excuse that, you know, judge him on this. Well, John Kelly had, no question about it, the toughest assignment of, of any White House chief in modern history uh, there is nobody like Donald Trump, uh, and there is no bigger challenge. But I think that Kelly made a fundamental mistake, and that is he reinforced all of Donald Trump's worst partisan instincts. One of the overarching problems of this presidency is that Donald Trump has not learned the difference between campaigning, which is dividing and demonizing and disrupting and governing, which is building coalitions and getting things done. But do you think he cares about that? Well, most presidents come into office full of hubris, thinking, intoxicated by victory, thinking they're the smartest person in the room. Most of them get over it. Donald Trump has not. Do you feel that President Obama also suffered from that same 
sense of hubris that perhaps prevented him from being able to work as effectively with the other side? Well, I think you can argue that, that Obama was not the most skillful politician who ever inhabited the Oval Office, that's for sure. But no, I think Obama understood the difference between campaigning and governing, and that's, and that's why he, one of the reasons why he empowered chiefs of staff to execute his agenda. Um, he chose Rahm Emanuel uh, to begin with because Obama knew that he had to do a lot of stuff on Capitol Hill right out of the gate. He knew that Rahm Emanuel knew the Hill. Rahm was also somebody who took the Hill, no matter what he had to do. And so Obama was able to get a stimulus passed. He was able to get health care, as messy as that was. He got uh, the Affordable Care Act through. That's because Obama figured out that he needed somebody who knew how to count votes on Capitol Hill. Donald Trump hasn't figured that out. I do feel like it's sort of a, one of those parts of history as well that people wouldn't necessarily get taught at school. Well, if you look at history, every president has learned, sometimes the hard way, that you cannot govern effectively without empowering a White House chief as first among equals to execute your agenda and tell you hard truths. Uh, Donald Trump is not the first president uh, who's had trouble figuring that out. Jimmy Carter was possibly the most intelligent president elected in the 20th century. He was trained as a nuclear engineer. But Jimmy Carter failed to understand something that Ronald Reagan figured out, which is that an outsider president needs an empowered White House insider to help him succeed. Uh, Jimmy Carter thought he could run the White House by himself. It took him two and a half years to figure out that he had to appoint a White House chief of staff. Uh, and it wasn't until the final year of his presidency that he actually appointed an effective White House chief named Jack Watson. It took Bill Clinton a year and a half to figure out that he had to empower a White House chief of staff in the form of Leon Panetta, his former OMB director, who came in and really turned the Clinton White House around. I think set the stage for Clinton's re-election. Do you see there as being sort of a surrogate chief of staff role for Melania Trump in the same way perhaps that Hillary Clinton was to Bill and perhaps you know more so Michelle to you know President Obama as opposed to Laura Bush say to George W. First ladies are crucial and White House chiefs of staff who blindside first ladies or who don't take them seriously always pay the price. Don Regan made the fatal mistake of hanging up the phone on Nancy Reagan. Uh, he was gone within a week. Um, Kelly uh, reportedly got on the wrong side of Melania Trump, and that may have also hastened his exit. Hillary Clinton made a tremendous difference uh, in Bill Clinton's White House. She was one of the first to realize that he needed to empower a White House chief in the form of Leon Panetta. Uh, up to that point, it, you could argue that she was the de facto chief of staff in the Clinton White House. I think we may discover when, when the history is written of this White House that Melania was more influential than any of us realize. The Mueller investigation continues on. It's been two years. Do you see former or current Trump chiefs of staff being caught up in the crosshairs in a, in a very profound way? This White House is headed into a world of trouble with not only the Mueller investigation, but with congressional committees gearing up uh, to have hearings, when they now have subpoena power. I think that if you're Mick Mulvaney or any White House Chief of Staff in this environment, you have to lawyer up before you get to work and you have to be very careful. And um, so it's a real challenge. And in some ways, the, the Clinton White House was a kind of model for a White House besieged uh, by scandal. And in, in that case, Mon the Monica Lewinsky affair. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. In those days, Erskine Bowles, the chief of staff, kept Bill Clinton focused like a laser on governing, and John Podesta, the deputy, was called himself the secretary of shit. He was in charge of all the lawyers. But they were able to keep Clinton focused on governing, and I think it's going to be a real challenge for uh, Mulvaney or whoever chief of staff number four winds up uh, being. Do you feel that President Trump has redefined the role of chief of staff for the long term? Well, he, he's defined it out of existence uh, is, is really the problem. When I wrote the book, I finished it before the election, 
Uh, then I had to write a hasty epilogue right after the election. And I said in the epilogue, I predicted that unless Donald Trump empowered a White House chief of staff, Donald Trump more than anyone because he had no experience in government, because he was the ultimate outsider, that he would have to empower a White House chief in order to get anything done. You know, I take no particular satisfaction in having been right about that, but the result has been uh, this inability to govern. But time is running out for Donald Trump. Uh, we're two years in, unless he can empower a White House chief to help him execute his agenda, I think, like Jimmy Carter, he'll be a one-term president. And after all of this, you just kind of, the, I suppose the, the obvious question in the room is, why would anyone want that job? What possesses people to want to be a chief of staff in the first place? Every incoming White House chief of staff, if he's smart, and so far we've only had men, of course, picks up the phone and calls Jim Baker and asks for advice. And Baker always tells them the same thing. Congratulations, you've got the worst blanking job in government. Uh, it is absolutely relentless, thankless, 24-7. Um, Dick Cheney blamed the job for his first heart attack. Uh, Bill Daley came down with a case of the shingles right after he left. It's a famously brutal and um, relentless job. And, it's, and, and you're right, it's a great question. Why would anybody want to do it? I mean, is it just power? That seems like the obvious answer. It's power, but I think if you talk to the White House chiefs who have done the job, and this may sound corny, but they will all tell you the same thing, that at the end of the day, as brutal and relentless and thankless as it was, that they wouldn't have traded it for anything else. It is a chance to change history. It's a chance to help a president uh, to make the difference between success and disaster for a presidency. And you'd be surprised if you talk to the White House chiefs, they will all tell you that um, it was a tremendously rewarding experience for all of them.